introduce to you Kayla Carson. She's in clinical partnerships at Shoreline Center for Eating Disorder. So Kayla. Hi everybody. Um, well, as Liza said, my name is Kayla Carson and I am the ADP of clinical partnerships for the Odyssey Eating Disorder Network. We are delighted to be in partnership with The Body Positive, and I always love sharing more about Shoreline, which has been the fam in the family of the Odyssey Eating Disorder Network since 2020. Shoreline Center for Eating Disorders offers the full continuum of care, including virtual IOP for all genders ages 13 plus in Long Beach, California, in addition to a PHP and IOP center in Southern Orange County. Our home-like environment fosters individualized and therapeutic care for all. Shoreline offers a diverse and bilingual staff, as well as increased training in affirmation of the LGBTQ plus population. Our clinical director and certified eating disorder specialist, Stacey Corpus, became certified in the body positive positive in 2018, and our clinical team are all certified and ready to embrace the fundamentals of the work. We are also delighted to have a new executive director, Mariana Stark, who is our red, also a registered dietitian by trade. I am also a dietitian, so I love when we have our, our other RDs in executive leadership. She has been an absolute delight and uh, we are just really grateful to have her at Shoreline. She would love to welcome you to Shoreline for a tour. So if you've never seen it, or it's been a long time since you've been on campus, please get in touch with Mariana or myself, and we would love to welcome you into the doors of Shoreline. We are a network with most major insurances, including TRICARE West, making treatment accessible for many. And we'd love to get to know you and just learn more about your practice and how we can provide excellent care to your clients. With our individualized approach, we can be a safe landing place for most people. And like I said, we treat ages 13 and up. Mariana, are you on? Did you make it in the room? I am. I'm here. She is. There she is. Oh, Hi. she has my name on. Let me. <laughs> she's a she's a Kayla Carson um, alter ego, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, thank you, Kayla. And uh, we're so excited for this event and everybody for joining and definitely reach out if anyone wants to come by or has questions about Shoreline and um, it's a it's a great space. Thank you so much. Awesome. Well, we will turn it back over to Elizabeth and Liza and let this uh, wonderful learning opportunity get started. Okay. I just want to remind everyone to please mute yourself when you come on. Otherwise, I'll keep. I'll try to keep on top of it and uh, mute you as you can come in. Um, I'd like to introduce though Elizabeth Scott, who is the co-founder of the Body Positive, and is going to be speaking to you today. So, Elizabeth, thank you, Liza, and thank you so much, Kayla. And I'm happy to get to meet Mariana briefly. Um, I'm Elizabeth Scott, and um, today I'm going to be talking about breathe, grieve, and love deeply, which is uh, a topic that's very dear to my heart, and I'm really grateful for all of you for coming. Um, Liza, will you keep letting people in as, I am. They're, as they're in the waiting room? Yes. Um, and I just want to mention my collaboration with Stacy Corfist, who's the clinical director um, at Shoreline. Stacy is a really experienced and innovative and like collaborative and systems building um, clinician. And I've had the opportunity to be in her case conference as a consultant for most of last year, uh, once a month and, and also consulting with her and her team is awesome. I would feel really confident referring to Shoreline, um, I feel really confident with her leadership. And so I encourage you to learn more about Shoreline. I, I really love their program and they're really body positive. And so some of the things you're gonna learn today, the foundation of everything I teach is the body positive model. And um, then you'll know that these are qualities and values at Shoreline as well. So 
Um, so thank you. Thanks for hosting us, Shoreline. This is this is exciting to collaborate. Um, so let's begin. And um, please do check your mute because I'm still hearing background noise. One person, but I don't know who it is. Um, I think I've got everyone, but we'll see in a minute. Okay, <laughs> I keep start talking. Going. Yeah, it sounds like somebody's galloping around in the background there. <laughs> Um, so I've been, um, so who am I? I'm the co-founder of the body positive, and I'm also the founder of the big hearted embodiment certification program, which you can learn more about at elizabethscottresources.com. This is a program that trains, uh, clinicians, RDs, psychotherapists to specialize in embodiment and uh, prevent and treat um, disruptions in embodiment like eating disorders. And um, folks usually enter uh, my world through the body positive fundamentals and then come to the big hearted embodiment program in order to deepen their um, experience and to learn more about a very social justice oriented way of treating eating disorders, um, a lot of ethics and social justice um, issues that we explore, like, um, you know, just the psychological impact of working with people who are sometimes quite ambivalent about living and where there is a high mortality rate um, with the eating disorders and about, you know, palliative care, hospice care for people who are, um, living with terminal uh, anorexia um, and, and you know, weight bias and social justice concerns related to social location, things like that. So I'm really excited to have you here and, um, and I welcome you and I hope you'll learn more about the Body Positive and about Elizabeth mm -hmm. Scott resources as well. But let's get to talking about breathing. I have been breathing for 64 years. No, I have been uh, practicing breathing for 33 years. So just about half of my life, um, I have been interested in breath practices, whether it was rebirthing, remember in the 80s, rebirthing, if you're old, you might remember them, um, in Santa Cruz, where I'm living again now, or I got interested in Stanislav Grof at, during my Esalen years and his breathing practices. And I've always been interested in yoga and pranayama, um, which is where the practices I'll be teaching you today come from, uh, come from Buddhism, which is a relative of yoga. Um, and uh, one of the things I wanna talk about before we start is just about how to offer trauma-informed breath practices. And I've learned a lot from um, David Trelevin, who wrote a book called Trauma Sensitive Mindfulness. Here, I'll stick this in the resource. And all the resources I mentioned will be on the handout we send you later today. So I, I can uh, share it with you. Um, but I'm gonna stick this book in the chat because it's interesting. Um, and send. Normal Murphy dog versus. Okay, now that's a new thing. Yeah, somebody that's really jumped in. <laughs> um, and so to be trauma-informed just means to recognize that <clears throat> folks who have an experience, a history of trauma, the trauma is going to be located and stored and organized in their bodies. And when, and so therefore practicing mindfulness where you're especially the very somatically oriented mindfulness practices I'll be teaching, we're inviting them to go inside and experience their body more deeply. It's going to activate trauma, right? They're going to become aware of this painful stuff. And so um, thinking about being aware of that, that even if it's your experience that you go inside and you experience bliss, it might not be the experience of your client, right? They might enter a space that is um, full of pain and complicated. And so how do we be trauma informed? Um, starting to be, first of all, we're just 
planning on inviting people to participate in breath practices. We're not commanding, we're not saying now close your eyes and start doing this, but we're inviting. And at the onset, always giving permission for them to stop doing the breath practice and do some of the other things I'll suggest right now. Um, acknowledge that this may not be the time or the place for them to get in touch with their trauma and process it. And there might, they might need you know, much greater resources before they do that. And so just acknowledging, inviting, and then um, offering alternatives. And so some of the alternatives that I'm going to recommend are, um, and this, if, if, if it's your experience that when you go inside your body, it feels conflicted and upsetting, you could use this today. And so one simple practice is just to open your eyes and come back into the room and notice the sensation of your feet on the floor, right? Which is a way of moving the awareness out of the more controversial center part of the body where the seat of emotions often is, and instead into the feet where you can feel some connection to the earth and draw your attention away from what feels overwhelming or, or at that moment deadening, depending on how you cope with trauma. So feeling the earth, the sensations of contact with the floor, you can practice this right now. Okay, Jason. So just tuning in. Do you touch us now? No, we'll decide whether you just need to go now or go ah. back and go in an hour or... Oh, I don't mind, we can go now. Do you have any way of telling who is unmuted? Yeah, I'm still trying to, I just saw who she is, but I think she just, she just muted herself. Okay, good. All right, very Not good. Not all, I'll let you know in a second. No problem. <clears throat> um, another thing that's possible uh, that can be helpful with the breath is just to remember a basic rule of thumb is that the inhale is activating, the exhale is calming. So if you can um, help your client to get into a long exhale rather than that <gasps> of, of anxiety, right? And I've done this with adults, um, but originally I learned it with children, which is just uh, to have them sing on the out breath. So I would say to a kid who's hyperventilating and really anxious or an adolescent, let's sing O McDonald on the exhale and see how far you can get without taking a breath. So ready, go. Oh, McDonald had a farm, E-I-E-I-O, and on his farm he had a chicken, E-I-E-I-O, with a and on his farm he had a cat, right? So the idea is to use the exhale as long as you can and, and a quick inhale, which is calming. So that's helpful if people are overstimulated. Of course, some of the ways that we cope with trauma is to deaden ourselves in which case the inhale, emphasizing the inhale would be more helpful because it's more uh, activating. But maybe they really don't want anything to do with breathing because it's again, too activating. And another technique that comes from somatic experiencing Peter Levine's work is just to open your eyes and orient to the environment. Paying attention internally might be too dysregulating. So, just inviting you to choose a sense object in the environment that is pleasant and let it be the anchor of your attention. So is there something in the room that attracts your eyes, something colorful or bright, something calming? Um, is there a sound you can hear? What is the most subtle sound you can hear right now? I can hear a tapping of a hammer far away, very softly. So just noticing that distant sound and labeling, ah, bird singing, car passing, rain falling. That's a way, again, to tune into the environment out of the overwhelming internal experience. Or through touch, you can notice what am I touching? What does the seat feel like underneath me? My elbows on the chair, the cool breeze on my neck right now. 
uh, the warmth of my sweater, right? So just contacting and labeling can just be a way of sort of accessing reality right now instead of whatever overwhelming intrusive experiences might be coming in. Smell, taste, again, bringing your awareness to your senses can help to externalize a little bit, to be tuning into where you are, not just the mind and the emotions. So I'm gonna teach two breath practices today. The first one is more calming, it's good for anxiety. And the second one is more stimulating, which is good for depression and it's good for tiredness. And the somatic meditation practices that I'm teaching come from Reggie Ray's book, The Awakening Body, which is also um, gonna be in the handout this afternoon. Reggie Ray has been my teacher for quite a long time. Um, I haven't met him in person, but I've done a lot of his online intensives. Um, but I just bought his book, The Awakening Body, and there's a URL link in the book that connects you to a website where he reads the meditations in his lovely baritone. Um, and it's a great way to learn a very somatically oriented way of practicing mindfulness. And I suspect those of you who work in eating disorders treatment are quite somatically oriented human beings. That's why you're so interested in the, in the body. So you may find that these body oriented meditations work for you to help you get out of your brain and into reality, uh, which is what's happening in your body, the present moment. Elizabeth, you're muted. How about now? Can you hear me? How did I get unmuted? All right, so not sure where I became muted. So I'll just say this meditation is called Central Channel Breathing and it comes from Reggie Ray's book, The Awakening Body. So we're gonna start, I invite you to sit comfortably with your sits bones contacting the chair. So you wanna lean forward in your chair to take your back away from, you can have support, but you want your back away from the back of the seat so that you're sitting like a plumb line between the top of your head and your chair. And you want your feet on the floor or, or wherever is comfortable. And do you want to turn your gaze inwardly? So whether you lower your eyes or close your eyes depends on what you're comfortable with. But you want to lower your eyes just so that your attention is drawing inwardly. So they're not like bugging out like a cartoon character and looking around at everything, which tends to activate your frontal lobe. Instead, you want to be drawing your gaze inwardly you could just imagine your eyeballs are like big jello balls falling backwards into your brain, down into your brain stem. So your eyes are very relaxed, whether they're opened or closed. If they're open, then you're just looking softly like, like you would take in a candlelight, you know, just sort of letting it in. And taking a breath in, imagine that your breath is coming up from the floor, from actually deep inside the Mother Earth, and coming up through your seat and into your pelvis, right between your two sits bones, and filling your lower belly as you inhale. And as you exhale, just let go. So you're really letting your weight settle, you're relaxing your neck and shoulders, your eyes, your jaw, and settling into the earth. You could even imagine that as you breathe in, you fill your pelvis with this quality of aliveness from the earth. And as you exhale, you relax all your tension down into the earth. 
and completely release your shoulders, any, any tension and stress that's emerging. And now just to contact the floor of your pelvis, take a deep inhale. And as you exhale, just lift up the floor of your pelvis. Uh, if you have a womb, you might lift up your womb. You might imagine that you're squeezing like a kegel to like to stop the flow of urine. The floor of your pelvis is a flat, wide muscle, and you just want to lift it up and give it a squeeze at the end of the exhale, and then breathe in again. And you'll notice the floor of your pelvis lifting up. We're not squeezing our buttocks or our anus. We're, it's more in the front. You're squeezing the, the floor where where the opening in your pelvis is. Try that again. And the exhale, you lift up the whole floor of the pelvis. And then let go completely and inhale. And try again. noticing the suffusion of breath and blood flow in the pelvis and the corresponding release in the jaw and the neck and the ears. And now breathing up from the earth into the pelvis, let the energy of the earth fill into your lower belly. And when you exhale, don't squeeze, just let go. But just contacting the floor of your pelvis. And again, I'm making these suggestions. You might not feel an energy coming up from the earth and filling your lower belly. You just imagine it. So you just imagine a quality of warmth or brightness or whatever resonates with you is filling up as you inhale in your belly. And just keep on breathing as I'm talking and just trying out the various uh, suggestions. Continuing to breathe into your lower belly about two inches below your navel and back towards your spine. And when you exhale, just let go. And when you notice that you're having a lot of thoughts happening and you've left your body experience, just notice what you're doing with your eyes. Because your eyes direct what part of your brain is activated. And if you soften your gaze and let your eyeballs drop inwardly, really as though you could see through the back of your eyeballs into the spacious interiority of your body, you'll notice right away that the thinking mind subsides. So when you exhale, let your eyes and your gaze drop all the way down into the belly. And of course, your mind will keep on thinking. You just consistently return your attention to softening your eyes and sensing the breath filling your belly. Now imagine that your lower belly is like a beautiful Italian fountain and feel the energy coming up from the earth like water flowing like a fountain up into your belly and a little bit higher each time up towards your 
solar plexus, and then just flowing up and over and down into the earth like a fountain. So again, just imagining whether you're in touch with this or not, imagine the earth energy up through your pelvis, filling your belly all the way up to your solar plexus, and then down into the earth. And now imagine your next few breaths, that your awareness is suffusing the inner channel of your body all the way up to the space where your heart is. Softening your eyes, drawing up this quality of vitality from the earth all the way up, suffusing your heart area with it. Relaxing your shoulders, your eyes, your gaze with the exhale. Now imagine that the breath is suffusing the inner channel of your body all the way up to your throat. Just imagining this quality of brightness, whatever the language is that works for you, coming up into your body and healing your throat. And now as you inhale, draw it all the way up through your neck and head, just to the top of your head. So that the waterfall fountain, it comes up out the top of your head and then down and washes your whole body in this quality of awareness. It's just a subtle, subtle vibration of awareness. Now you can let go of the focus on the central channel and allow your breath as it comes into your pelvis to fill your whole body, down to your toes, up into your shoulders, arms and hands, your back, your whole body. And when you exhale, letting go, returning yourself to the earth. Just noticing what you experience when you allow your breath to fill your whole body, every cell. Just noticing your gaze, softening, softening, softening. Always knowing you can adapt my words for what's right for you at any time. You could stop, you could lie down, you could walk around the room, whatever is needed. But just for a few more breaths, if you like, allowing your breath to infuse your whole body, drawing up from the earth, 
and then returning to the earth. Just see if there's a word that describes the quality of energy that you're drawing in for you. Just so that you can have a word to help you find your way back. The next time you sit. So what's the quality that you feel? What would you call it? When you're ready, come back to the shared Zoom space that we're all sharing. And if you feel like it, put in the chat the quality that you experience, what you would call it. Clear, glow, washed, peace, mm. stillness, ease, fullness, peace, serenity, mother, refreshing, peaceful bliss and happiness, orange, relaxed, calm, quiet, calming, presence, yellow, supported, stillness. Yeah. So the humans, we've been practicing meditation for thousands of years. And some language uh, people have used for, you know, thousands of years and millions of people. And so sometimes the language has a certain momentum. I find I study um, Buddhism and um, when I'm tuning in, I chant the name Kuan Yin because Kuan Yin is a quality, an archetype, you know, a part of who we are inside that has been, that name has been used by, you know, hundreds and thousands of people for generations. So it has a certain momentum um, I think it's the same quality as Mother Mary, and we're, for those of you who that resonates with. Um, but I, I think you, I've used for years spacious interiority. So whatever is the language that resonates for you, and you can try other ones that people have used over, over the centuries, if that's helpful as well. I like Brianna Bowen, washing. That is totally my experience of, of this meditation practice. I, I know I brush my teeth, I take a shower, but I sit down on my cushion for an internal washing. And just the breathing in this quality of the, the earth and breathing it out, I feel washed, I feel caught up. So I might find in my heart when I'm practicing a pain, uh, or whatever is true, I'll find out by sitting and washing my insides with this quality. And so maybe I'll cry or maybe I'll realize, oh, I have to do this or wait a minute, that makes me mad. I better address that. I just notice what I'm feeling and what is the quality of my thoughts as well. If I'm rattling around a lot of fears or anxieties or blame or other troublesome mental states, then I just notice that when I'm when I'm practicing and bring that awareness energy to, to that part. And it feels very washing. So I wonder if, um, you know, I have noticed in um, the talks I've been giving lately that 
people much prefer to chat uh, questions and comments. And it's pretty difficult to get people to unmute and share. And um, what I find happens when we do it that way is that um, the dialogue is very disjointed because there's just one comment and one response, but never any conversation or di ongoing dialogue. So um, today I would just like to, on a couple of occasions, invite you to unmute and share so that we can have more dialogue in this hour instead of just the more choppy uh, chat communication. So. Um, I just want to ask if one or two people would be willing to uh, raise your hand so um, Liza can see it and and then she'll say yes, go ahead and unmute. And if you could just share, how is this practice of central channel breathing for you? What do you experience? Just a little more detail than the chat. Carly, I can see you. Go ahead. So for me, um, it feels a lot right now, like what you shared about um, really being able to feel um, strongly, like the feelings that I had kind of repressed or that had been repressed. And um, so it it feels to me as um, like a really great practice to be able to tune and tap back into um, like the deeper sides of myself that kind of get um, hidden away mm -hmm. and that I need to like work on bringing back up in order to kind of, like you said, clean out my subconscious and um yeah, for me, it definitely feels like a habitual routine I need to keep up in order to kind of stay sane because otherwise I feel overwhelmed and um, just overburdened with my own thoughts and feelings. And I, I just resonated a lot with um, what you were sharing too about um, like the kind of spiritual momentum that you feel by chanting. I'm also Buddhist. Um, and so I chant Nam Myoho Renge Kyo and Om Mane Padme Om, among other things. And um, I, I really do feel that as well. And um, I mainly feel inspired to kind of take on even more time in my day to sit and meditate. And um, I feel like that would help my own um, mental and physical health journey overall and I guess a question for you I have is um what what more do you know about the um uh I I forget the name already but I remember Yin was in it Huan Yin Huan Yin yes could you share more about that with us so Om Mani Padme Hum is a chant to Huan Yin so you've been, you already know about it. You just chant that and feel in your body and then you'll know what is Kuan Yin. You're, you're muted. Yeah, I, I was just um, yeah. taking it in, but yes. Yeah. Um, so so the, in Americans, we have a lot of concepts about um, religion and chanting and all of these practices. So I don't wanna lose anybody in this part of the conversation. Um, Again, we're talking about accessing internal experiences. And in some of the uh, Asian meditation practices, there's language for this that is maybe unfamiliar to us in the West. And so um, I invite you to try it out to feel how, what is the experience in your body rather than getting conceptual about it. Um, but Kuan Yin is a, um, a word that is used again by millions of people for 2,500 years to describe this quality of the mother earth that is kind and compassionate. That is, that is this quality of awareness that underlies all of the, the things that arise, all of the impermanent things that come and go in our lives. 
Elizabeth, uh, Joanna Hill is wanting to speak. Very good. Thank you, Kayla. Let's hear from Joanna Hill. I'm sorry, Carly. Thank you. Hi, um, I'm going to go very more, I don't know, practical is not the right word, but um, I have trouble with brass. I teach meditation and body image, so I'm very interested in you. <laughs> um, and okay, let me see. I have issues with breath because breath is, is um, anxiety producing for me but I want to get over that so that I can teach breath because I know it's useful. Mm -hmm. um, the word that came to me was washed and that idea of washing. For some reason, water is less problematic for me than air. I don't know, I don't know why, but, um, but my concern is that I also come from sexual health where there's a lot of um, stigma around the idea of, oh, of course the cat comes now. Um, uh, dirty, clean, that paradigm. And I don't want, I don't, I don't want, I don't want to cause more trauma. I don't want to suggest that this is a clean, like it is a cleansing, but I, anyway, I just was hoping you could comment on that. Well, I think that you can be clear of, of uh, what are we cleansing? If we're cleansing your sins, it can be complicated, but if we're cleansing your what you've internalized that doesn't belong to you, then it could be uh, freeing. And and I think it, I think in terms of your experience, it, you can be very 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 gentle with yourself and and try breathing one percent longer on the exhale, and and a letting go of your fears on the exhale. And then, but doing what you normally do, but just adding 1% more awareness of the breath. And you don't have to manipulate it at all. You can just notice the quality of the breath. It's very, very practical. And all of the mindful, all of the practices in Reggie Ray's book, where you go to the URL and he'll, he'll take you on the guided meditations, they're all very somatic. So that's really, he never talks about dogma, theory, mantras, anything like that, even though he's a Tibetan Buddhist for, for 60 years. But it's more listening to the, the micro details of posture and breath, because it's like um, Carly was saying, she's cleansing her unconscious, or they are, I didn't get your pronouns, Carly, I'm sorry. Um, but that the idea is, in, in Buddhist thought that the unconscious and the body are the same thing. Our whole unconscious self, everything that's not just the part up here is located in the body. So it's just entering the body a little bit more and inquiring what's there. And if you have a history of trauma or whatever has caused your anxieties, just inquiring. Oh, and bringing a quality of resource, which I'll talk about that more um, right after this, you know, just what qualities are needed. Thank you, Joanna. I like it so much when people speak. So thank you, Joanna and Carla. I appreciate it. Though. Let's go. Oh, let's let Annette talk and then we'll go on to a little bit more description. Thank you, Annette. Hi, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Um, yeah, I'm really glad I was able to join today. Um, I was able to, you know, I really liked the practice. I was able to feel the and feel energy. I felt an energy coming from my feet, especially um, up into the same way that you described it. I felt it and was able to, you know, get into get into it in that way and had um, moments. Um, where um yeah i felt the energy come all the way up into my throat um which was really great however <laughs> this makes me um you know just tune into um how out of practice i am um i'm training mindfulness and obviously um um body positivity but i'm horribly out of practice and i felt my mind was super active and i was very distracted and i kept having to bring myself back bring myself back bring myself back um 
But it also, as I was doing it, I was alerted to different points in my body that had tension and, um, you know, that needed stretching, that needed something. And then my mind went off into, oh, what exercise plan did I do? You know, <laughs> you know like, oh, oh my God, I have 16 Pilates classes I need to use. You know, like, just, <laughs> like so I just kept like going into so many different directions. And so I was like, okay, you need to go back into your practice a lot more. Um, and, you know, I mean, these, these are judgments, but, you know, I, sometimes you want to be like, oh my gosh, my life is a wreck. How am I helping other people, right? Yeah. Um, but, you know, that doesn't mean that you can't help people. And, you know, those are all judgments anyways. But um, yeah, just alerted, to, alerted me to that, um, the level of distraction and like active, activeness in my mind. So um, it just kind of reminded me that I need to practice, um, get back into my practice much more than I am. Um, but I, I was able to, to connect and to feel my body and to feel the points in my body. And the word for me that I used that came to mind was OM. Oh. So I just, I just repeated that um, in the practice and I, and I felt like, you know, it's the universal, universal world for peace, right? So I just um, use that word in my practice. Gorgeous. But yeah, that's exactly <laughs> how you do it, Annette. And the thing is, if your mind is very busy, just give it something to eat, you know? So here, take OM and just give your mind something to do, which Ooh. should be OM or or beauty, spaciousness, whatever is the word, but give your mind something to do. So it's not like, and another thing, you have to go back to Pilates, you know, just like uh, uh, when you touch something good, do you have to be flogged for not doing that every day? No, you could just touch something good. And then for a, lightly, just for a moment, think, I would like to do this more. Okay, that's enough. We don't have to go back. And another thing, you always, you never, when was the last time? You don't have to start all that, right? So just, this is where I think um, in Buddhism, we talk about wisdom and compassion. They must come together, right? So you have this moment of wisdom, like, oh, this brightness is inside of me. I have access to this. And then comes in the, the, the flogging, like, why don't you, you never. And that's where compassion is needed, right? Mm -hmm. So just like mindfulness, kindness, mindfulness, kindness, so that it doesn't get you into trouble, right? Because if we just have mindfulness, if we're just intensely present and focused, well, you know, we're just as likely to be a good sharpshooter with that skill, right? We, it's, it doesn't necessarily lead to ethical behavior unless it's combined with kindness. And so, mm -hmm. You could just be, oh, here's where I am. This is the beginning of me bringing a little bit more self-awareness and kindness to my body, mm -hmm. my breath, 1%, 1% a day. I really I love how you describe your mind and all the places it goes. And there's one uh, Zen proverb where they talk about you, you, meditation is putting a bullfrog on a plate in front of you. And every time it hops off, you pick it up and put it back on the plate. Oh, that's great. And so your mind hops off and says, mm. oh, and I should probably buy some new meditation cushions. I find I'm often shopping when my mind is going off the deep end. I'm just oh, like, I had those thoughts too. I could meditate better if I had more, you know, I could go online. And so um, I just label it shopping, get the frog, put it back on the plate, back to meditation. And then it hops off. It's like, Oh, but you never, you know, come back, get on the plate. We're, we're just breathing here. We're not judging my life. Thank you for the little tidbit. Like, was it, if your mind is, if your mind is hungry, give it something to eat? Yeah, just give it some food. Because your mind is always going to be thinking, just like your stomach's always digesting, you know. It's just an organ, it does thinking. So give it something to think about. Mm -hmm. You know, like Carly with a, a chant or a mantra, if you're an auditory oriented person, it can be really helpful to do chanting. Mm -hmm. you know, a, lot of, a lot of famous musicians chant that Nam Yoho Renge Kyo because they are auditorily or oriented, right? Mm -hmm. And it's helpful to just access that part of their brain. Um, but for me, I'm more somatically oriented. So I just return to the sensation in my belly yeah. of the breath coming in and out. Any and, object of meditation keeps your mind busy. 
and that, that was something too, like, you know, I mentioned like feeling tension and stuff in my but I also felt my belly. I also, you know, my stomach started to rumble out all of a sudden, you know, yeah. and I'm just like, okay, what is that? You know, like, yeah. you know, is this something that I need to be doing? Like what, what's going on here? No, it's you not know? something you need to be doing. It's just yeah. awareness, just awareness. I think what I've seen over years and years is just bringing your awareness to whatever you're experiencing touching it with awareness is adequate it will begin to transform maybe you'll pass gas but something will move right <laughs> but just by touching it with awareness you don't have to figure it out mm. just mind mindfully noticing ah tension in my belly pain in my throat just noticing and just allow it nothing to do Thank you, Annette. Thanks for sharing. Thank you. Let me give you a few more things to think about, and then we'll we'll learn another practice. Um, so this this practice of breathing in and letting go, this is like a very basic practice um, that you'll find in a lot of psychotherapies. You'll find it in a lot of somatic oriented therapies. You'll find it in um, Tibetan Buddhism and Vipassana Buddhism. The idea is to use the breath as a tool to connect to the present moment because the breath is always in the present moment. So it's just a useful mechanism. And we breathe in and we allow this sensation of aliveness to expand in our body. And then on the exhale, we release whatever that self-awareness is unearthing like Annette says it gets me in touch with this or this or this and then just let go of that in the breath you don't have to analyze it and have a lot of insights about it unless it's um, you know unless it won't go away and eventually you'll figure out something about it but just noticing it and letting it come in and out so if you think of the exhale as letting go of tension, you can include everything in the exhale. It could be um, pain, right? It could be grief, thoughts, holding, um, judging. It, it, you can exhale everything in order to just get in touch with the spaciousness inside that underlies everything that arises, every thought and feeling. What's right underneath that? is this spacious platform where you can rest. And that's what we're trying to get in touch with, just this quality of awareness. And it's important to remember that even while your mind is shopping, planning, criticizing, and judging, your body is still meditating. There's still, it's always meditating. Your body is always perfectly present, breathing in, breathing out. And then on top of it is your little mind doing what human minds do, right? But just to know, I'm just going to return my awareness to this breathing body. It's always there. And sometimes I just feel so grateful for my body. I just sob my eyes out when I'm meditating because it's so precious to know that my body is right there, still beating my heart and breathing in and out no matter where I get off to for months at a time. So through the practice of breathing, we can let go of the pain in our bodies, which is how we are defending against healing. Little by little by little, it doesn't have to be, you know, pounding the pillows like in the 60s at Esalen. It can be just touching gently the pain and letting go. Um, it was uh, Prentice Hemphill who talks about breathing, we, we can practice breathing and letting go because the practice of freeing ourselves from internalized oppression is about not accumulating pain in our bodies anymore. Prentice Hemphill is a beautiful uh, somatics teacher and uh, formerly the head of wellness and, and, and health for Black Lives Matter. Um, and now runs their own um, training program for folks who are who are not normally included in um, 
healing and psychotherapy and breath practices like um, returning citizens from prison, um, BIPOC folks, um, trans folks. I really love the work Prentice Hemphill does. They also have a great um, podcast. So through the practice of breathing, we can let go of the pain in our bodies and get in touch with the grief that we feel and practice letting go of pain not accumulating pain in our bodies, right? And I, th and I think this is important because we are losing so much right now. There's so much loss involved in just the normal problem with impermanence that we suffer from just that that's the human condition, but also personally and as a species, we're in a tremendous time of loss you know, whole species are dying out every day. We're facing imminent catastrophe. It's constantly being pressed upon us that we're living in a way that's not sustainable on this planet. And there's, and the causes and conditions that are leading to this enormous loss, you know, is a tremendous amount of, of greed and, um, clinging to all of the resources that a small number of the humans are doing and causing extreme inequity uh, uh, in, the, in the majority of folks. And that, that greed and that waste and just is, is got us caught up in this very, very destructive pattern. And I think if we don't talk to our clients about what it's like to grow up not knowing if the world will be sustainable, not knowing if their children and grandchildren will be okay, that's an enormous psychological feat. And so to be able to find the resources to get in touch with our grief and grieve is incredibly essential because it helps us stay in touch with what we love. As long as we're defending against the pain of loss, we're not in touch with the, what we love, right? Because if we get in touch with it, it's so scary, right? It's so risky. It means that we're gonna have to face this potential tremendous loss. And even just in the normal everyday levels of impermanence that we deal with, we have to know that the people we love, the, the things we love, the, the practices we love, everything that is close to us now will at some point become other than that. So I just remember the morning after my wedding years ago, I spent the whole day sobbing because I realized that to marry this person introduced the loss of this person, that someday he would die or I would die or we would get divorced or some, some way we would become separated. So loving deeply introduces a tremendous loss because of impermanence. So if we can't navigate loss by exhaling, how are we going to love deeply? If we don't believe that we could survive if we lose someone, how are we going to love them? It's so dangerous. If, if the losses we're facing break us, then how will we manage, right? And sometimes these losses will break us. And Joanna Macy talks about that, I'll quote her. So practicing breathing and letting go is a practice of grieving the pain that we feel in order to be able to calmly face how things are with presence and stability. If we can breathe, we can let go and grieve. Our bodies know what to do if we get out of the way. We just sob our eyes out. It's a superpower. It's a superpower I learned in my 20s when my fiance was dying of cancer. I learned that I could love him absolutely fully with the knowledge that I would lose him imminently if I could just cry my eyes out often even though it gave me a big headache and you know you lose a lot of minerals, I could get to the other side of the terribleness of it if I could grieve. So I learned about letting go and letting go is just a practice of breathing. It looks a lot like 
a woman in labor, right? Just let the body do what it knows how to do. But if that's terrifying because it feels really out of control and overwhelming, we can just do it slowly, slowly breathing in a long practice every day, slowly letting out all of what we've internalized, all of the grief that we face. So this practice of grieving, we get in touch with our love for the world. It's painful, it's poignant, it's meaningful, and it's the opposite of distracting and deadening ourselves. This practice of grieving in community, it comes from the work of Joanna Macy, who's my first Buddhist teacher, a deep ecologist, a systems theorist, a Buddhist scholar, author, teacher. She's brilliant. She's in her 90s. Her book, Active Hope, is in the bibliography I'm going to send you today. And she talks about this time as the great turning. She talks about this time where you know, this next 10 years where we need to figure out whether we're going to just keep marching on being greedy and unconscious or whether we're going to turn it around and make the world a more cooperative and sustainable place. She talks about that it's about chaos and opportunity to build a cooperative and sustainable world. She says, the great turning this time, this meditation practice, it's about refusing she says, if you're refusing to feel pain and become incapable of feeling pain, which she calls, that's actually the root of apathy. The root of apathy, the language, it means refusal to suffer. Apathy is about deadening ourselves, right? But if we're willing to see the pain, instead of making ourselves dull and half alive, which causes us to be blind to what's going on, right? This is not what we need. But as we face these enormous losses in our lives, just you know, old age, sickness and death, right? Just the basic ones, right? And then there's like, and will the world be safe for my child, right? Kind of bigger ones, right? As we face these losses, we find that we're not here alone. So it's immediately, it blends us with, with the other humans, right? We not only have each other, but we have the ancestors behind us who have also worked tirelessly for change, for positive change, right? And we have the ancestors in front of us, our children, our, our friends' children, the folks who are being born now. I don't know if you've noticed, like the 19 and 20 and 22-year-olds, they are deep and brilliant. They are here to handle what's going on right now. And so are we. And maybe you are one of those 19 to 21 year olds, but we are here at this time because we are who's needed. But how are we going to resource ourselves to face the tremendous losses and keep on loving, keep on wanting, keep on working to, to create change, right? So if we feel the ancestors behind us, and inside of us, right? Our ancestors, as they show up in our bodies, right? We, I look out of my eyes, my mother looks out of my eyes, my father, my grandparents. In my hands are my grandparents, my Norwegian farmer grandparents, right? So if we feel our ancestors in our bodies and the future ancestors that we're trying to hand the world to, we have some community. And I feel like, she says, I feel they surround us at times as witnesses. And if we open our heart minds to them, they can give us guidance and strength because it helps us realize how big we are. So, unquote, in the depths of grief, we can find connection with others who grieve and a steady heart, right? If we're not lost in resisting all of the pain because we we know, we know the superpower of grieving. All we have to do is breathe and let go and the right things will happen, right? We can purify the pain out of our chest. From this clear-eyed place, we can reach really deeply for connection to all the folks who suffer because we're not afraid of their suffering either because we know how to grieve and we can grieve with them. To me, this is 99% of psychotherapy is teaching my clients to grieve. 
When we breathe and let go, we model for our clients the enormous resource of grieving. So even just my clients will often say, you take a lot of big breaths. What are you doing over there? And I'm like, I'm letting go. I'm letting go of pain. And they're like, I was wondering if you're feeling impatient with me. I'm like, not at all. I'm making space in my body for your pain so I can be with you. That's why I'm breathing like this over here. When we stop running from our grief with demands, defenses, distractions, which is you know the three main ways we try to avoid pain, we just feel a lot more pain. And when we sit with our pain and tune into the breath and letting go of our exhale, we can find our de a deep acceptance of how things are. Sometimes in my 10 day meditations with my teachers, we'll be practicing and the teacher will just say right in the middle of like a 40 minute meditation, she'll just turn on her mic and say, ah, so this is how it is. And then another 40 minutes later, ah, so this is how it is, right? So grieving is the process of accepting how it is. It doesn't mean giving up. It just means acknowledging things are hard. 19 species died today. The sun still hasn't come out in Santa Cruz. This is the weirdest season we've ever had, right? The world is odd, people suffer. So this is how it is. How do I make room in my body for that big letting go that seems to be required? And from this grief, from the bottom of letting go, I get in touch with, we get in touch with our love for each other, our love for the world. Like I may be dying someday, but I love you right now. You are so precious to me, right? Because I'm not defending against losing you. I know I'm gonna lose you. And that's how I know that this precious moment, I'm gonna have it completely. I'm gonna exhale and let it fill me. So our leadership is needed in this area, right? In this area of teaching about grieving because we are in a position to serve a lot of people who are suffering so much. And we can serve them by helping them with their anxieties about the future, by letting them know you have the capacity to grieve and accept what is, because those are things you cannot change, and to breathe in a quality of love and bring your best heart to the situation around you. So in our work, we can ask our clients, what are you grieving? And how do you attempt to avoid your grief with this symptom? Really, you really think that by starving, you're not gonna have to face the losses you're dealing with? You really think that by binging and purging, you're gonna not have to face the fact that your body is the size and shape it is, and that you live in a society that projects judgment and hatred at you for how you look? No, those are just realities. But what resources do you need to face the losses? How can I be with you, give you company? I always feel like, you know, we have in a lot of therapeutic approaches, the message is just face reality, face reality, face reality, but no resources. You know, so it's like um, exposure therapy. I'm just going to feel how it is and face it, right? No, I'm going to cultivate the resources so I can tolerate facing. So I always try to bring the resource first. I don't tell people, get rid of the symptom. I say, oh dear, you're dying in the desert without any oxygen. Let's get you some oxygen. So let's start with breath, with kindness, with contact from me, with uh, whatever resources the client figures out that they need, right? Always resource first, then facing the enormity of the losses. So Joanna says, but it's not over yet. And I'm here with my brothers and sisters. And even if we as a species go under, I have to admit, 
It does look more likely today than yesterday that we will. But even if we do, we're going to discover how big is our strength and how big is our love for life. We can do that and see how much we care. And we can be scared. I can see myself now in a situation where I could forget these words, but I'm not broken yet. And I'll forgive myself ahead of time if under the pressures that the system has developed and used on plenty of other people, if my mind breaks. I'll forgive myself ahead of time if my mind breaks. So this is this 20, you know, 93 year old woman just talking about having empathy for ourselves if the losses are so enormous that we do break or we, we have a physical symptom or we get sick and die or we feel crazy, right? Recognizing that it is big, it is hard what we're facing. And if you add a lot of trauma and broken relationships behind you, it's gonna be a lot harder to find the resources. So by acknowledging losses with our clients, not only the personal ones, but the big existential extinction anxieties that are always on the, you know, pressing down on us, you can help them identify what losses they're struggling against. And the work is to find the internal and the social resources to let go of what is lost and embrace how it is right now. Focusing on the psychological parts that we're clinging to the symptoms because we feel like we'll be destroyed if we let go, right? See what qualities those parts need. So, for example, ask the critical voice that's saying, shaking its finger, saying, You don't meditate enough, you don't do enough work on yourself, you'll never be clear enough to be a good therapist, la la la. Turn to that part and say to it, Dear critical voice, Dear voice of fear, what is it that you really, really need, dear one? Right? So turning towards the parts that are afraid to let go and face how things are and find out what they need. What's the resource they need? Company, forgiveness, patience, time, right? What is the quality? And then you can help the client find more of that quality, give themselves more of that quality on the inhale, right? Kindness, right? Forgiveness. And all the while modeling your own resilience by breathing in the room with them or on Zoom with them. Again, anybody want to unmute, raise your hand and then unmute and just share um, your thoughts about this part of grieving as a resource for getting in touch with what we love and finding ways of fighting for ourselves. Or just a comment about how this is landing for you. Go ahead, um, Susan. Thank you, Elizabeth. Hi. Um, as a young mom, I recognized that mothering was grieving because as my children grew, I lost who they used to be. Right. And it's not that I didn't love each stage, right. but, um, but there was that loss there. So acknowledging that really helped me with it to not fight it yeah and so um this practice that you're bringing to us this realization of how deeply embedded grief is and the fear of losses really resonates and touches me obviously i'm crying but it really um fits with my own experience and mm -hmm. I'm really interested to reflect on this and think about bringing it to my clients more. Beautiful, Susan, thank you. Yeah, loving is a continuous process of grieving, but never more than with our children, 
who are, I spent the whole first week of my child's birth crying that she was growing up too fast. And I, I got on the phone with a friend who had four children and she was like, Elizabeth, get a grip. Every stage is going to be lovely. And yes, they are. Their job is to leave you and your job is to let go. And I was like, what was I thinking? Introducing, putting my heart out there in a body that's going to eventually drive off in their own car and be gone. And she was like, yeah, it's a spiritual practice. You reach deeply for a quality of love and compassion for yourself because it's all about grief. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you so much, Susan. Lynn DeLaurent. I really appreciate, you know, I hadn't thought of grieving as a resource um, with my client. Um, interestingly, I've worked with a few of the clients that I've worked with. I uh, brought it up and it made, you know, so much sense to them. But, you know, but for like, considering it as part of like my toolbox for clients in general, you know, I hadn't looked at it the way that you're really describing it today. So, I, you know, again, it's giving me a new appreciation for that grieving. Yes. Yeah. Appreciate you, Lynn. Thank you for sharing that. Yeah. I think that um, it feels to me like this breath practice is um, full enough and enough to share. So I'm going to wait on teaching the second breath. Um, just because it's a more purifying breath. And I think um, that's a lot. It's a lot to, to do right now. Um, but I would love to share more breathing practices with you. So I just want to pause for just a moment and, um, and practice the central channel breathing just for one more moment. So again, just getting comfortable just to access it and see if you can find the word that you accessed before um, to contact a quality of brightness that comes up from the earth into your body and fills your whole body on the inhale. And just forgive yourself if you haven't meditated enough or practiced or breathed enough in your life. Just right now, here you are practicing. And so just in this moment, breathing in and filling your whole body with oxygen, with awareness, with kindness, with whatever the word is that resonates for you. And when you exhale, just returning all of your grief and loss to the earth, all pain. All effort and striving. And just allowing a, a quality of love and kindness to fill your heart, a quality of forgiveness for yourself. And again, you might not be in touch with it, you might be in touch with something else. So you just imagine it, just imagine a quality of kindness filling your heart and spreading out to all of the people who are sharing this meditation with you right now in all of our disparate locations.
And when you're ready, just coming back into the room and seeing if you can stay connected inside of your body, even with your eyes open. You can just feel the, the pain in your body or the love or whatever the quality is you're feeling right now. Just touching it gently and then being present here as well. And I'll tell you a little story about my, um, when my mother was dying last summer. Um, she had been dying for a while in the winter, last, last winter. Um, I was practicing this breathing a lot and also a more, a little bit more purifying breath where I would lie on the floor and breathe in really fully like this and breathe out of my mouth really fully. It actually does resemble a labor breath quite a lot if you've ever done that. Um, where I would do that for about 10 minutes every morning and uh, just let go of my grief. Um, so I felt quite up to date um, on the day that she died. I felt like um, I had been staying abreast of my grieving quite, quite well. But on the moment um, that they took her body and they wheeled it out to the truck to take it away, I was standing, I followed them outside and I was standing on the front porch and, and the sky was really, really big, like that, those kind of days with the high cirrus clouds in the blue sky. And it felt enormously spacious. And I felt in my breathing at that moment, it felt like, um, like a blackbird was stuck in my chest. And I breathed and I felt like, um, well, what happened was a sound came out of my body that I had never made before. It was just this high pitched keening sound that I felt like I could allow because of how enormous the sky was, like that there was room for that level of grief. And so I just was making this sort of high pitched letting go cry. And I felt like this blackbird that had been sitting in my chest. So this, this chunk of grief that it flew right out of my body. Like it released in that sound and my, and in my breath, that was the sound was animating my breath. And right then, um, this beautiful a black man with a New Orleans accent, who was pushing the cart, who came to pick up my mother's body, he turned to me and he said, we'll take care of her. And I just let go. I, I let go so completely that all my attachment and my ideas of my mother and being a daughter, it all disintegrated into just what was happening right then, which was that she was utterly and completely gone in her physical form. But my love for her, her being looking out from my body, her, the aliveness, the love that we shared was absolutely fully present. So fundamentally, there was no loss, just the enormous loss of her body, her voice, her language, hugging her every day, all that loss, yes. But fundamentally underneath this quality of interconnectedness that I belong to her, that she's in my daughter's song, that she's in my crickety knee, that she's in my big heart, right? There was no interruption between us. And so I let her go. So she went. And I haven't suffered since then. That was August 6th. That's almost a year. I haven't suffered. I feel up to date with that loss. 
And it helped that I had the beautiful opportunity of grieving with her for, you know, years before she died, right? It would take much longer. And, you know, sometimes it's really, really hard to ever get to this place with loved ones, right? It's more complicated. But when somebody's 93 and they die and it's their choice, like I'm getting out of here, this body sucks, I'm not doing it anymore. It makes more sense, right? And so the combination of just the breathing practice, the, the superpower of knowing how to let go, which just means like, let your body do what it wants to do, which in my case was to make this keening sound that was really intense. And then it passed. And then I went inside and made dinner for everybody. So I think uh, if you can, stay abreast of your grief, just so that you're not sobbing your eyes out all the time in your sessions with clients, right? So just staying abreast of it, then you can sit deeply with them. And frankly, sometimes I do cry with my clients. I, I have a client who recently showed me cutting that she had done on her arm and I just sobbed. I just sobbed at the pain she's in. But generally, I try to keep let them do the crying and me be present with them as best I can, just by staying abreast of my own pain as best as I can, right? And that means seeking really deep resources, which for me is my meditation practice and my, um, my community of practitioners. And you, right? People who are deeply committed to uh, healing the world and ourselves and who are brave, right? Who are willing to feel pain and know that we have spiritual resources, we have breath, connection to the earth, meaning a sense of our humanity, a forgiveness for our humanity, our imperfections. The fact that we're just mere mortals who also will get old, get sick and die, right? We're just transitory moments. Is this helpful? So maybe you could just put in the chat a little bit of um, feedback about what's what you're what you're getting, or you can unmute and share. Kate Funk says, "Thank you, Elizabeth, for this training, but especially sharing the story of your mother's passing. Incredibly powerful. I won't forget it." Thank you, Kate. Thank you. Carolyn, this is so helpful as we live with my husband's terminal cancer. Yeah, we don't know when we're going to lose the people we love. So I regularly just call them up and protest my undying love because you just don't know who's going to get cancer and die and, and, and will it be you? And I just sometimes I'll just call like Connie, my partner at the Body Positive and just say, this has been such an incredible ride. I have no regrets. If I die today, I love you. You know, just to let her know, I, um, I have no regrets. This is um, very helpful. Great presentation. Your voice is soothing and helps stay present. Thank you, Jean. You have no idea how helpful this has been, says Brianna Bowen. So beautiful. Wow, they're coming in so fast. Thank you. Thank you for offering this and sharing your wisdom. I know it's time and some of you may have clients. And so if you jump off, um, I'll understand. And I'm very grateful for your beautiful presence this morning. I really felt it. I especially appreciate the people who unmuted and shared because I felt like it, it brought us all a little bit more in the room, as they say. Thank you for this offering and this sharing of wisdom in yourself. Lorraine says, your description of grief and loving is moving and empowering. I'm shedding tears I didn't know I needed to shed. Thank you for sharing your story. Wonderful, crying, that's my superpower. I keep Kleenex everywhere. And I have to say, you know, you're supposed to be like more centered if you meditate more. It's made me into much more of a crybaby. I cry, I cry over everything. I'm like a terrible, you know, corny person, but I just love having my heart feel that open. So it's worth it to me. And I never apologize when I cry. I hate when people do that. 
they start crying and I'm so sorry. It's like crying is the gift of, it's when you know your truth. It's the most beautiful moment. So when you cry, you can just say, oh, I know my truth right now. And it is, I love whatever it is you're grieving, right? So don't apologize, just speak your truth when you're feeling grief. Shelley Ball, my dear old friend. Elizabeth was my first supervisor when I was an MSW student and continues to be my favorite guru. <laughs> Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Shelley Ball. I do a lot of supervision. If you find out, if you want to join my supervision group, it's really rich. Um, go to Elizabeth Scott Resources on the training page and you can learn all about that. Deborah Kresh, thank you, Elizabeth. Beautiful way to start my day. Angelica says, this discussion reinforces that without love, there would not be grief. And to avoid grief would be to avoid the gift of love. Yeah, exactly. April, hugely helpful. Thank you so much. Lo loving is a continual process of grieving, right? We got that from one of our sharing people. Susan Brum, thank you, Elizabeth. This was meaningful and helpful. Joanna, wash away what doesn't belong to you. Thank you, thank you for your generosity of spirit. Carly says, I just turned 20 and I was feeling like I'm growing up too fast, but now I feel far more youthful and ready to take on the journey that's only really beginning today. I feel so whole with this community and getting in touch with my ancestors and the people who will be coming into this world this morning. Yes. Thank you, Carly. Uh, I lost a young family member to suicide and I'm thinking how this works when you have sudden shocking loss. Then, and that it's all compassion, not a lot of wisdom, right? Kindness, 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 kindness for yourself and for the person who left in such a violent way. Kindness. And taking your time. It takes much longer. Suicide is very, very, very difficult. Thank you, Dana. Very helpful presentation, Yvonne. It's so hard to talk about grief and loss and I hugely appreciate that you shared your experience. Oh dear, thank you so much, all of you. I'm gonna just stay on and keep reading these, but you may have chores and I appreciate you being here. Love to you, Shelley. Love to all of you. Therese says, I love this so much. Such a wonderful reminder to my clients that power of crying. Nicole says, grief has been a part of my life with clients, body image, getting married in the fall. I connect with your story. It's nice to talk about accepting it and that it's okay. Diana, thank you so much. Several clients, spouses have passed away. Your presentation was very helpful. Blessings. Joanna, thank you. Thank you, everyone. Blessings to you. Thanks for being here. And thanks to Shoreline for all they've done to support the Body Positive and sponsoring and being a certified program. Thank you, thank you. Mm -hmm.